And Christopher, I will now address you, and then Mr. Singh from Gao. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know you're just off lunch, so I hope I can keep your concentration for a few minutes. Um, I saw the program. I know the program has been rather flexible. I saw that I, the most recent version of it indicates that I'm speaking on implication for the national economy arising out of the decline. Well, the decline, as I interpret it, would be the decline in sugar in the earlier version of the program I'd been asked to speak on rice as well. Now, I think as far as rice is concerned, in 2007, the production of rice was 298,000 tons, sugar was 266,000 tons. Currently, or at the end of December 2016, Rice was 600,000 tons, which was an increase of 101%, while sugar, that was at 266,000 tons, is now, at 2016, 188,000 tons. It is projected to be much less than that in 2017. So, at best, the decline in sugar has been 29%, rice has been 101%. It's interesting to look at some of the characteristics of rice and sugar. Rice is essentially a private sector operation, though it still has elements of the feudal system where you have the lord of the manor and the, the peasant farmers producing and selling to the major operator. Rice tends to be more capital intensive in comparison with sugar, although one can su suggest that part of the big problem of sugar is a lack of capital, appropriate capital expenditure. Because if you were to just look at capital expenditure, the, the monumental failure of Skeldon project was 200,000, 200 million US plus. That, as we know, has been struggling in terms of capital investment as well. Earlier this morning, I was speaking with a senior manager of Gaisuko a couple of years ago, and he was telling me that the East Demerara Estates were the best prepared for mechanization. Yet, if you look at this apology of a paper called State Paper on the Future of Sugar Industry, it does not address the question of mechanization. Both rice and sugar produce for the domestic market and are also significant exchange earners. Sugar at one stage used to be a substantial source of foreign exchange. And if we were to look again at the relative contribution, or the, the sorry, the absolute contribution, sugar has declined from 137 million United States dollars in 2006 to roughly $70 million in 2016 because, of course, the first thing you do is meet the local market. What we see 
is that in terms of foreign exchange earnings, the rice has increased 235%, sugar 51%. Now, those are some rather depressing statistics and perhaps support the notion of the downsizing of the sugar industry. Let me briefly say, and Raymond Gaskin was asking me, well, what do I say about sugar? If we keep the present framework in place, all you have is subsistence farming for the majority, majority, the absolute majority of rice farmers. My view is that the, the architecture where you have these farmers going and lining up sometimes for days on end to get the rice, the body sold to a few big millers should be restructured. My own view is that perhaps these farmers need to form themselves into a body, whether you call it a cooperative or whatever form, and take the whole process forward where they themselves are the exporters and operate in a, with a view to making significant revenue. The present situation does not guarantee them any real success. There is also a relationship between rice and sugar. Sugar produces and protects the environment, the low-lying coastal belt, with a drainage and a, an irrigation structure that protects not only the rice sector, but the housing communities in the coastal belt. In terms of their overall revenue, data is not available either for rice or sugar to the national coffers. If I had to speculate, I would suggest that may, it's not particularly significant. However, in terms of employment, in terms of foreign exchange, in terms of social value, neither of these industries can be ignored or, dis or dismissed. Because if you were going to take the tens of thousands of persons who depend directly and indirectly into these sectors, on these sectors, they have no livelihood in the rural areas, what then happens? The social implications of the future of sugar and its consequence on rice need to be considered. And let me, as I remember at this point, say this as well. This state, state paper says nothing about the new economic sector on which we are embarking, and that is oil and gas. There is a misunderstanding, I believe, as to what the Dutch disease means. There is not a country that without extremely sound planning that can avoid the Dutch disease. Because it simply means this. If we start getting a significant inflows of foreign exchange, and this is what happened in Holland and the Netherlands, this is why we talk about the Dutch disease. If that happens and your currency appreciates, I know we in Guyana are accustomed to depreciation, depreciating currency. But if we have this inflow of foreign currency and your currency appreciates, what then happens to rice, sugar, bauxite, gold, diamond, forestry, 
that are all primary commodities that are traded in foreign currency. It means that the Guyana dollar value of those produce will in fact go down and there are going to be serious implications, which is why I come back to this paper. I'm absolutely disappointed in the lack of thought, the lack of common sense, the lack of intelligence that, that has gone into the preparation of this paper. We cannot be talking about the future of any industry without thinking what will be the impact on the rest of the economy. The paper does not explain what it means by economic prices. If one were to take that it means on the open market in a, it's an open market, but it's, it's a price sugar nowhere in the world. We hear about sugar is sold at 12 cents per pound in the international market. Well, the trouble for it, sugar, is that wherever it is, it's a subsidized price. It is not a market price. Nowhere produces sugar at that kind of price. What the paper says is we're going to, Albion Rosal, Blamont, and I flock Wales. It means East Demerara goes. And as I said, the, the, the person who spoke to me earlier today was telling me that the East Demerara estates were the place that was most ready for serious mechanization. They, he estimated, and this was a senior person, he's now working in the Caribbean, he estimates that it is 85%. Now, this paper lacks vision. We are back to the same situation where all we do is produce raw sugar. There is absolutely no value added. There is no downstream benefit from this plan. So it really, really means absolutely nothing. A couple of years down the road, what we will have, oh, because of econ economies of scale, this doesn't work either, and it's a downward spiral. It's clear that we have to think where we want to go. Gaisuko has made, over the years, Gaisuko and the government. We cannot exonerate the PPP from the decisions that have been made in sugar. Some of the decisions that have been made are mind-bogglingly incompetent. We have to decide, as a country, the extent to which we want to subsidize any industry, whether it's sugar, whether it's rice, whether it's bauxite. We must not forget there's a permanent subsidy that arises in a place of linen when it comes to electricity. Nobody talks about that anymore. It is, apparently, that's off the table. So we as taxpayers, to what extent do we want to subsidize an industry that isn't clear, that doesn't have a clear future? And a clear future does not mean that you can see everything. We can't. But a clear future must mean that we have thoroughly examined all the possibilities. We look at all the economics. We look at the labor market. Do we, in fact, have the labor market to keep all the estates open? The answer is probably no, which is why you have the factories, but you don't have the, the throughput, you don't have the canes to put through those factories. We have to decide. The unions have to decide. Do we want no job at all, or are we prepared to take it, maybe jobs that pay us less than we want, but what can be afforded? These are objective questions that have got to be addressed. The problem I have is this. The chairman of, the chairman of Gaisuko 
is our renowned economist, Dr. Clive Thomas. Dr. Clive Thomas wrote in his column, Development Watch, on January 5, 2014, all hopes for a rational, considered, and ordered reform and reconstruction of the industry are lost. So why did you put him there? To prove himself wrong? He's not going to want to be proven wrong. So, did somebody read what Clive Thomas said about the sugar industry before appointing him as chairman of the board? That all hopes for a rational, considered, and ordered reform and reconstruction of the industry are lost. That is not a serious... To, to put Clive Thomas the head guy, Suko, was clearly to be the undertaker of the industry, unless he had renounced that article that he had published. This paper on the sector ignores and it is one of the great ironies. The paper was presented to the National Assembly. It doesn't say a date. That's how bad it is as a piece of paper. By Honorable Noel L. Holder, Minister of Agriculture. It appears that Noel Holder did not read the AFC manifesto in which they talked about mechanization, in which they talked about value added, and in which, and I am quoting their language now, shifting the Demerara sugar estates and the West Burbies estates to ethanol. That is their word. Those are their words. What happened? Did Noel Holden not read the AFC manifesto? They went on. This was the 2011 manifesto. You know, politicians have a way of reborning. So if you look at the 2015 manifesto, it may be difficult. Different, sorry. It went on. Ethanol blend of 10% by 2013 and hydrous E15 by 2015. That means you mix the if I'm wrong, please tell me. You mix gasoline, 10% ethanol produced from the agricultural project by 10%, and you shift the cost. Has the AFC abandoned their principle, their, their intellect as well as their principle? I mean, who are, how can we have a serious discussion and the debate with persons who don't read their own bloody paper. How can we? And, and as I said, no one must be exonerated at this stage. Because the unions, they, they never really came up with a sound plan. If you want to counter A, you have to produce B. Where is that? It has not happened. The way, and I've, I've, I've gone, I live in Ogle. I've seen how fields have been abandoned. And the starting back of agriculture ain't easy. Even in the kitchen garden, let alone in a place like tens and hundreds of, hundreds of acres. The demise had been predicted by Clive Thomas and possibly executed by Clive Thomas because he's chairman of the board. The question is, how do we get that serious discussion going when everyone 
has a different song sheet reading from a different page, even if they're reading from the same book. And as I said, in my view, at this point in time, no industry will be unaffected by the advent of oil. We know we haven't heard about, we haven't seen the contract and so on, um, but the, the outlines are there. The Minister of Natural Resources indicated what the outlines of the arrangement are at a meeting with the Guyana Chamber of Commerce and Industry a few days ago. I don't know whether the politics of our country are such that we can have that sensible discussion. I don't know whether the time is not passed for that sensible discussion. But all I can say is that whatever time we have left, we've got to make it, make the best use of it. And to that extent, I'd like to congratulate the Indian Arrival Committee on this rather ambitious program. Evan Passard is always very ambitious. It's the most it's a, did, did you, you're expected to do three days in one with Evan. But it's got to be done because if we don't do it, the future of Guyana, even with oil, is as insecure as it is with oil. I thank you very much.